looking at my family history, um, we have medics in the family, but we don't have scientists. Growing up as a child on the south coast of England in, in Dorset, which is quite a rural county, we did, quite close to where we lived in Dorchester, have the Winfrith uh, nuclear site, which was a test reactor site. My next door neighbour was one of the sort of senior people in the environmental team there. And so I became aware of science and engineering from a sort of environmental and energy standpoint quite early on through conversations over the garden fence. I think looking back now at my childhood, what I do now as a job is definitely influenced by those films and TV shows from the sort of 1980s, which are very sci-fi oriented. Big machines, lasers, robots, x-rays, all of these kinds of things were that as a child really appealed to me because they were exciting, there was an element of danger, um, and it was very much science fiction is always about being at the forefront of what's technically possible as a, as a human species, right? You know, exploring space, building spaceships, and that had fascinated me from a very early stage. There's definitely a, um, a familial drive, which I think is within me. It's, it's within my siblings as well to want to, to do things that matter and they contribute positively to society. I've said my family has a lot of medics, so I'm the odd one out in a way in that I'm a doctor, but I'm the wrong type of doctor. My father was an architect and designed and built lots and lots of schools and sort of public buildings. One of the drivers for my dad was that he was building a piece of history which would last longer than him. And I think when I then looked to my grandfather, he was actually in the uh, British officer in the Indian Army uh, at the time of World War II. And then later in his career, he did special technology um, projects working with the Pentagon in the US. So there was a big sort of impartation from him onto me that very much he wanted me to be in the army. I'm, I'm not cut out for the army, but what I realised is that I did want to contribute to my country through what I did, very much in the way that he contributed significantly to our country through what he did. I'm just going to do it in a different way. I came to the University of Bristol and what I realised through my four years of studying there is actually uh, I wasn't so much a geologist, although this has stood me in amazing stead since, and I've lecture in the School of Earth Sciences as well as the School of Physics, but actually I was a materials person. And the things that really inspired me when I was studying geology was things like mineral physics and geophysics. What I had an obsession for is sort of crystal structures, chemical formulas, how things were forming and deforming. And that really sort of was the thing that I've taken forwards through my career is this curiosity to be able to understand and to predict how materials will behave. My PhD was focused on the low level nuclear waste repository, which is up in Cumbria near, near a village called Drigg. And specifically, my project was looking at the transformation and the potential mobility of uranium inside the engineered structure, which are the trenches at the, um, that I was looking at. But also, if it escaped the trenches, then how fast would the uranium move? Would it stick to minerals? If so, which minerals was it going to stick to preferentially? It allowed me to grow from my roots in geology, because that was my background, understanding the ground, if you like, and the soils and sediments and rocks. But it also then allowed me to do hands-on experimental work with uranium. I'm still doing work in, that, in, in the area of nuclear waste and nuclear waste management because it's still a problem uh, globally. My work at the moment is principally sort of three components uh, to the sort of direction that I'm taking. The first is, is still about materials and understanding materials and discovering new materials and how you make certain types of materials. And that's very much uh, directed at energy, uh, specifically nuclear energy. And uh, at the moment I'm working with the uh, UK Atomic Energy Authority on fusion uh, technologies and developing the fuel cycle for fusion reactors that we'll have in the future. Now, some of the materials that we need to use are very light, so the isotopes of hydrogen, uh, so deuterium and tritium specifically, 
but also the materials that you associate with creating those isotopes, so lithium isotopes, and then also for storing them, which would bring me back to uranium again. So the, the way that we store deuterium and, and tritium gas is to use uh, uranium metal as the storage material, in fact. So there's a strong link through from fission to fusion where, when it comes to uranium materials and then fusion fuel materials. And in terms of making those materials and understanding them, that brings in my second part of my activities is developing instrumentation and instrument techniques that we can probe those materials and, and understand the chemical state they're in, how they're transforming. The final part is when we want to understand materials that are environments that are too dangerous for humans to go into, then I, part of my activity is around developing robotic platforms which will then carry my instruments into those dangerous places and then we can make a remote analysis um, such that we don't have the situation where we have to send people into dangerous environments. So the robots can take the hit um, and the humans can stay safe. It's globally recognised now the problem of burning fossil fuels and we're hearing scientific reports that you know climate change is going to be very very tough to reverse and so we need to have a diverse portfolio of energy sources which which don't produce co2 or other greenhouse gases into the environment and nuclear is is a key pillar technology that our government in the uk has recognized is is super important for underpinning uh, energy in the uk going forwards but it's been recognized worldwide that that it is a key technology now at the moment we use nuclear fission. In the future, I hope we will use nuclear fusion as well and there'll be a gradual transition from one to the other. But in both of those technologies, fission and fusion, materials are the key thing in terms of not only providing the fuel, but actually providing the structure of the reactor systems. And understanding and choosing the right materials to make those systems is intrinsic to the safety and efficiency of those systems running and also to some extent to the cost. I think you could say that all of these low carbon energy sources are problematic or they have challenges that need to be overcome. For nuclear the public perception is often that it's a dangerous technology and that's because we've had previously nuclear incidents, Chernobyl, Fukushima, but I think what's misunderstood is that th th those incidents happens at sites where it was the very early instances of the nuclear technology and that the modern nuclear reactors that we build and we operate today are the sort of uh, really very modern, partly automated, extremely safe with lots of sa safety features. The technology of the future also will be further steps onwards in terms of extra safety features, you know, some aspects of safety being passive by design, such that we wouldn't have a, a Fukushima or Chernobyl incident in the future. If we're going to continue to have nuclear energy um, going forwards, we, we really need to be able to demonstrate that we know what to do with the waste. It's one of the challenges of nuclear that you can't get away from. Uh, nuclear, nuclear reactors produce waste. And so dealing with that waste effectively is what the UK and all the other countries that are going to do nuclear have to, have to make sure that they've got the answers for. And, and part of my research is very much directed at that. In our first generation of nuclear reactors in the UK, we use uranium metal as a fuel. These were the Magnox reactors. And m all of that fuel now is, is stored up at Sellafield site uh, up in Cumbria. And my research using diamond light source has been directed about understanding how that uranium transforms in the different storage environments that it's been held for, you know, 50 years or so in some instances and that it starts out as a metal fresh out of the reactor but if you leave it in a silo or you encapsulate it in grout that as a function of time and and the environment around it so water vapor or liquid water for example then that uranium is going to corrode and it, some of what's been seen with with uh, uranium containing waste which are encapsulated in 500 liter drums shows that after several decades those drums start to have lumps and bumps appearing on the sides where the expansion of the material inside is putting a considerable force against the drum walls. Some of my most impactful research at the Diamond Light Source has actually been able to simulate small nuclear waste systems where we've encapsulated uranium in a grout, in a cement if you like, 
and then we've watched it corrode and we see what happens to the cement and we see what happens to the surrounding containment which is stainless steel and that led us to insights which then subsequently when shared with Sellafield and the National Nuclear Lab uh, allowed them to change how they were packaging their waste which was safer it was faster and it was cheaper and the sort of saving that that's made for the UK taxpayer is, has been on the order of something like 200 million pounds. Uh, obviously, uh, post March 2011, after the Fukushima disaster, there was significant worry about the spread of nuclear material, not only across the part of Japan which was contaminated, but also whether it would go further afield. Very quickly, we started to work with the Japanese government and we got in on the ground. We assisted with sampling of different areas in the, in the fallout zone, which is a completely unique experience. Um, but it allowed us to work with the Japanese and to recover particulate samples that we could then analyze. Some of those samples we could analyze in university laboratories or, or other national facilities. But when it came to really understanding the internal structure of, of some of these quite highly active particles, we needed a diamond light source and we needed its capability in terms of being able to map elementally the structures that were inside and it allowed us to get a forensic insight into the fallout materials which then allowed us to piece together the actual sort of conditions which were present at the time of the explosions that occurred and it also allowed us to verify that there were tiny fragments of, of spent fuel material in some of the fallout materials that, that fell near to the plant. And what that did is it helped the Japanese government to redefine the risk map for the fallout zone. It, it helped them understand whether the evacuation zones they originally set, which were quite arbitrary at the time, whether they could be shrunk down. It helped them to understand where they should focus their remediation efforts as well. And it also provided some insight and assurance as to how the material was likely to behave in the environment. Now, what was actually quite fortuitous about the conditions for the explosions is that the reactors had got hot enough that the thermal insulation, which is essentially uh, like a rock wall, it's a silicate type material, but you could think of it as a reconstituted rock, had got hot enough to melt. And so when the explosions occurred, this melted silicate material condensed and formed a glass. And it's fortuitous in that glass doesn't react very quickly in the environment. And that glass was entrapping some of the nasty radioactive materials. And in fact, we use that when we're dealing with highly active radioactive materials. We vitrify them because it's a very safe thing to do. So in a way, we, we help to demonstrate that some of the material that's been ejected, which was associated with these glassy particles, actually posed much less of a threat than people initially thought. I'm progressing along sort of two tracks really. So one is about nuclear threat reduction. Uh, this is topically very important, I think, at this point in time where uh, we have a world which is really very unsettled. Uh, we have a, a war in Ukraine which has been uh, raging around nuclear facilities and there is a real uh, you know, possibility, more so than ever before, of having a, a disaster which is actually deliberately induced, you could say. Th through you know military means and we want to make sure that we can do our best to try and prevent that happening but also make sure that we are suitably prepared in case something does go wrong and that we have been developing technologies we're training people in the use of technologies which allows us to respond much faster and more efficiently to nuclear incidents and I see that as societally really really important The other aspect of where I'm also driving is around um, what I hope to, to help along with the rest of the international community is this transition from fission to fusion. Fusion is a different atomic energy technology. In my view, it will be when it becomes commercially mature, more efficient, 
and safer and it will produce less waste. It's, it would be uh, virtuous to, to be part of the sort of campaign that develops that technology and specifically what I'm interested in is developing the fuel cycle for that technology because there are lots of different uh, countries and organisations all trying to develop different types of fusion reactor but they're all going to need the same fuel. So my work is very much focusing on how we develop the fuel cycle, how we develop the fuel materials that will be used because irrespective of who gets the first fusion reactor, they're all going to need our fuel. And, and that's something that very much for the UK, if the UK can, can get the foremost expertise and capability in fusion fuel cycle, that will put us in a very good position for decades to come because we will underpin fusion across the world. The materials for fusion are very exciting. They go from one end of the periodic table to the other. So they go from the hydrogen isotopes through to tungsten, for example, and rare earth elements that would go into magnets. You've got possibly the most complex engineered systems that human beings will ever devise, which are fusion reactors. And the materials that, that need to live in those reactors will, it, some of them be very, very cold. So the magnets will be cooled to cryogenic temperatures and then within something like a meter of the cryogenic parts of the device you will have a plasma which is something like a hundred times hotter than the sun and the materials that need to sit around that as armor are going to have to withstand incredible temperatures so materials research around fusion is exciting because you're talking about materials in extreme environments and, and it's not just extreme because of the temperatures, it's because of the neutron flux, it's because of the number of cycles that the material will, ex will experience. There are incredible changes that can happen. And what we need to be able to do when we design these power plants is have a pretty good predictability for the materials that we're selecting in terms of how they're going to perform in the long term. Because what we don't want is a power station that works great for about 10 weeks. And then after that, I'm sorry, we have to turn it off. It's not going to work anymore because all of the materials inside are broken. So we need to get this right by making sure that our material selections are good and that we can design power plants which will last. Because this is a lesson that we've learned from our current fission reactors in that modern fission reactors, when you build them, will be operating for somewhere between 60 and 100 years. It's a really good long-term, long-performing asset and we want that same performance and behavior for fusion reactors. So this is very much why, as a community, we're very excited about materials because you can't do fusion without the right materials. And we're part of the solution in terms of finding and developing those correct materials. Again, Diamond provides a unique tool for being able to look at materials under extreme environments, for example, but also to look inside the materials as those materials are changing and to be able to visualize or to quantify through different sort of diffraction techniques or, or mapping techniques, how those changes are taking place.